This video is sponsored by Chimera.com. Tune in later to find out more about them and how you can save 10% off your next purchase. Who thought we would be returning so soon with the stench of death still in the air, so fresh from our beloved childhood RTS? Blizzard is no more. At least they aren't the same Blizzard. And we don't need to spend an entire video attempting to convince ourselves that they are. Activision Blizzard is in full effect. And I have something to admit, detectives. I didn't fully acknowledge it in the Warcraft 3 Death of a Game video. Which if you haven't already seen it, please go do that at some point. It's relevant for this video and the story. The fact is, I didn't look at Blizzard in 2018 or 2020 as fully evolved Activision Blizzard yet, as my video kind of exhibits, and that's wrong. Because after taking on the behemoth of a case Overwatch, you can already see the signs back then. Oh, speaking of which, Overwatch. The king of the hero shooters. The same game that killed many of the titles we have covered on the series already. That's what's on the menu on today's episode of Death of a Game, the post-mortem series where we document the evidence and clues concerning the largest contributing factors to the death of a game or company. With the sequel announced, and then delayed, and Overwatch 1 now existing in some sort of weird limbo where content updates are coming fairly infrequently for a once titan of a multiplayer title, I think it's safe to say that Overwatch 1.0's time in the sun has come to an end, with Overwatch 2 set to near forcibly take it over once implemented. What went wrong with what seemed to be this shooter title that did no wrong? A mega blockbuster that helped shift the industry. How did the title in shorter time than some of its competitors fail to last at the top of the mountain despite initial overwhelming success? Choose your role in Hero and prepare to drive the payload to what might be the most precipitous fall from grace for a popular shooter we've covered thus far. While Blizzard's tale begins in the early 1990s and encompasses numerous titans such as StarCraft, WarCraft, and of course World of WarCraft, we're going to rewind to 2007 and just take a little pit stop. Following World of WarCraft's massive success in 2004 and the subsequent years, Blizzard, who was still very much Blizzard that we knew at the time, was interested in recreating the magic and producing yet another successful MMORPG. Jeff Kaplan, who worked on WoW prominently as both a game director and head of PvE, where he got the job being a prominent player and community member of EverQuest 1, would lead the team, and the project would be dubbed Titan. If you want to read more details about what the game was originally set to be, check out this piece from Jason Schreier that details more. But for the sake of keeping the video shorter, I'm going to condense it. Project Titan was in development for six years, from 2007 to 2013, and it would never see the light of day, as by May 2013, it was cancelled. There's not much details otherwise released about what the project was, but we know it was set to be an MMO project with an interesting duality of regular social day life and a PvP combat slash focused night portion. Players could do things like run shops, businesses, and even start families. Just to illustrate how serious of an MMO style approach of a game they were going for, here are some of the buzzwords used to describe what the game was supposed to be. Team Fortress 2 meets Destiny meets The Sims meets World of Warcraft. But perhaps the full story of Titan is a story for another time, especially when it wouldn't be fully realized and development shifted to a new project altogether. The topic of this video. November 7th, 2014 is when Blizzard announced their first new IP in 17 years, Overwatch, a team-based 6 vs 6 multiplayer shooter with a focus on fun, over-the-top characters. In Overwatch, you played on a map where you attempted to push a payload as a team, or you tried to keep said payload from being pushed and then you had an attack and defend phase for certain parts of the map, or certain maps entirely. While kills had an impact on the result of a match, the ultimate objective was the objective. Showcasing the announcement was a CG trailer showing off Pixar-like animation, and a very pretty art style. Following the announcement, limited gameplay was also shown, where one team must defend a point and the other will attack, utilizing a range of different characters and abilities to do such, such as turrets, shields, and healing streams. There were 12 playable heroes available, and the title was playable at BlizzCon 2014, with a closed beta to come sometime in 2015. Blizzard would reveal more details concerning Overwatch March 6th, 2015, such as two new heroes in McCree or Redacted. 
Cole Cassidy, the gunslinging cowboy with a pistol, or Zarya, the energy laser gravity gun giant Russian lady with cool pink hair. Characters like Zarya, as explained by Blizzard, were developed in a response to a supposed desire for more diversity in games. That's what made Overwatch's character cast so good though. It was diverse, but not in some way that felt overly forced or kind of gimmicky. Each hero was as unique as the stereotype or aesthetic that they were trying to accomplish. There was a bit of flavor for everyone around the globe. But most importantly, unlike many other copycats later on, Blizzard's simplicity of the package of each hero was the most impressive part. Anytime you see Zarya, you know it's Zarya. Big gravity gun, shields all over, you get the idea. The hero identity in Overwatch was just very quality. Most importantly was announced the closed beta to come in the fall. Although expectations were initially that the game was supposed to be a casual shooter, and as expectations as in just a few months prior, but now expectations were already starting to shift towards would Overwatch be a competitive shooter? Jeff Kaplan, the lead developer on Overwatch, would wisely caution against an aspiration for esports, citing Hearthstone as an example, and that you need to give the community a chance to grow competitively, grassroots style, which I fully, wholeheartedly believe in. If only they would have heeded that advice. Blizzard would take a different approach with their closed beta, one that would anger many fans of the company and those interested in the game. They would only allow a very limited amount of testers in, choosing to go for a more true beta-style approach. I was one of the lucky few who got invited into the beta, and boy was it a different sight. For starters, they actually had a scoreboard. I was very much intent on becoming a pro player in Overwatch. That was my aspiration on this channel before making content about Star Wars and, well, the death of a game series. I even won one of the first unofficial lands, Dreamhack Austin, where we beat a top collegiate team and won the open brackets. Story time. The whole thing is kind of crazy. Now to be fair, I basically just got carried, because the last second, a pro player from Team Liquid, V, asked me to play on the team because they needed a sixth, and then at the last second just told me to play tank because the other four teammates, who were shooter monster players from other titles that had championships, but had never played Overwatch before. So I was stuck on tank duty. But still, for a time, I technically was the highest earning pro because in that same tournament, on tank, I won a razor blade for scoring the play of the game in the finals. <laughs> And no, if you're wondering, the play of the game wasn't even impressive. That's the best part. I just yeeted somebody off the map as Reinhardt and basically killed myself in the process. But I was a razor blade richer after that. That's my personal history with Overwatch. It started in closed beta. We being the competitive crowd full of ex-pros and current pros from other games and then the MMO gamer nerd like me, <laughs> would make lobbies all the time and just play together. It was a blast. It's what made me so hyped for the game's potential. We even had a series of tournaments organized by Gosu Gamers where we got to see shoutcasted matches of Overwatch during the closed and open beta. So how did this end up angering fans, besides it was just limited testing? Well, all of this is how hype is being built, and Blizzard's first IP in almost two decades being showcased as an eSport, yet not playable by most people, well you can kind of imagine why people were so angry or interested in playing. That's because anytime something's competitive or seen as competitive, people want to be, well, competitive. Which means they want to have their chance to play the game, testing or not, and have it fair. Blizzard restricting access was fairly common for a beta, but wasn't typical for the mainstream audience at this point, with betas shifting to more marketing ploys at that point than an actual state of the game. Overwatch and closed beta though was a special experience, so I can't completely blame people being annoyed that they couldn't experience it. Especially when, to be honest, a good portion of all the best players in the game later on were the same players in closed beta, grinding in lobbies. It was very much the typical quality Blizzard testing experience, and I say that as a tester of Diablo 3, StarCraft 2, and Heroes of the Storm in Alpha. Overwatch's launch was announced at BlizzCon 2015, as well as more information such as the fact that it would include 21 heroes and, and only cost $40 for the standard edition. The reason for this is that it will be launching multiplayer only, just like Team Fortress 2. I'm sure not trying to draw any comparisons, right? But console players would kind of get shafted here, as they would have to pay the full price of the game, $60, and get a multiplayer only game. Overwatch Beta would come to a close December 3rd for a short break before coming back in January of 2016. Overwatch would be during this time swirled in a, uh, controversy, if you want to call it that, regarding a certain tracer pose. Blizzard was asked to remove it by many fans sensitive about a girl with some junk in the trunk. But this wouldn't mark the last of the controversies, unfortunately, that Overwatch would find itself in. More lore and hype was generated for Overwatch with the impressive animated shorts that would start launching March 2016 and onward. These shorts were so good they had the player base asking for full episodes. To counterbalance the fact that they were multiplayer only, but not free to play, 
Blizzard would announce that all Overwatch content post-release, such as maps and heroes, would be free. Overwatch's open beta would take place May 2016, just before its launch, where Blizzard would revel in incredible success as they would pull in 9 million players. Overwatch wasn't only Watch Anymore, available only to a select few. It was playable to millions of people, and taking over the world before it even launched. Activision Blizzard was putting the time, effort, and money to make sure that Overwatch's launch was huge. They even took the time to have a bunch of giant oversized Overwatch characters put up across the globe, in Busan, LA, and Paris in particular. The Overwatch that was launching May 24th, 2016 though, wasn't the same Overwatch it started as anymore. While many changes were likely due to the fact that feedback was being received and they were trying to respond to such, Blizzard would change key aspects of hero balance and even key things such as removing the scoreboard that originally existed. But some things didn't change, or weren't really accounted for properly. For starters, the game would launch without a competitive mode, leaving how Blizzard would handle such kind of a mystery. Would they allow hero stacking, for example? Or do as some of the community tournaments were doing at the time, restrict them in some way? It seemed like Blizzard was going to try and solve that problem after the fact, which would work if the community had a chance to evolve organically. Blizzard's 6 vs 6 hero shooter Overwatch would launch May 24th, 2016, and score 91 out of 100 on aggregate review website Metacritic. Game Informer would score the game a 100, stating it was fresh and consistently fun and a masterful polishing. IGN would score Overwatch a 94 out of 100, stating it was an incredible achievement in multiplayer shooter design. Overwatch as positioned for was a smash hit for Activision Blizzard, grabbing numerous awards including Game of the Year and being named Game of the Year by outlets such as Eurogamer, Game Informer, IGN, GameSpot, and The Escapist. In under just one month, Overwatch had reached 10 million players, immediately becoming a blockbuster hit. But while that's certainly impressive, and a measure of success, the true measure of success is the porn scene that sprung out of nowhere for Overwatch and business was booming. I'm just kidding, but seriously. It showed the level of cultural phenomenon that Overwatch had reached. If there were any serious issues with Overwatch, they weren't exactly apparent yet. At least not for most players. The game was smashing every record imaginable, and it was hard to think of it being anything short of near perfect. But less than a month after the launch of the game, and already there were some clues forming about what would become of the fate of Overwatch. Questions about if Overwatch would be an eSport were all over the headlines. More importantly, if it did become an eSport, or more competitive shooter, would it have what it takes to become successful at such? You might be wondering how some of the very respectable names in eSports were dubious from the start about Overwatch's future as an eSport, but it's because the biggest issue in Overwatch eSports or competitive, or just watching it in general, is the most glaringly obvious. Overwatch has an issue being discernible to experienced players in a competitive environment with a spectator mode, let alone completely new players or ones who are just not experienced enough. It's difficult during the heat of the action and team fights in Overwatch to discern what's going on. This leads to key impressive moments getting kind of lost in the shuffle. Early on, people thought it was just inexperienced observers, which is typically what people say, but over time it was shown that Overwatch as a game in general is difficult to understand if you're not very familiar with it, and even then it's difficult. It's not just the abilities, it's the fact that the game is 6 vs 6 on top of all of the abilities. It's not a traditional deathmatch either. It's a payload map that oftentimes turns into a capture point style map, which means by literal design, there's tons of waiting around for the payload to move, for you to run out of spawn, and etc. No other esport has had such a design for a game mode. So you have all of these abilities, the shooter parts of Overwatch thrown in there with hit scans and projectile based characters alike, and the non-typical shooter game modes all contributing to a recipe of poor visual clarity during esports and competitive play. Contrast this with a classic sport where the concept is simple, it's just get the ball on the goal. Or other shooter esports where it's just like kill the other guys or plant the bomb, but it's also still technically kill the enemy team. These are way easier to understand and visually see take place. This wasn't some death curse though for Overwatch, it didn't need to be an eSport. Team Fortress 2 the game in many ways, it was emulating, had an eSports scene but was almost entirely community run. There could still be a scene for Overwatch to have a similar thing, regardless if it was created right away, or artificially through the outside investment, 
or expectation. But with ESL announcing a six-figure tournament for Overwatch June 2016, it's hard to imagine the game was going to have much of a choice not being shepherded into becoming a competitive esport. One $100,000 tournament, not technically even officially supported by Blizzard anyway, wasn't enough to push the esports scene too quickly necessarily, but it wasn't going to help matters, as the game and its popularity, regardless if it should be an esport, would attract players and interests. Remember, within a month it had 10 million players. But if Blizzard decided to fully commit to esports without correcting some of their design issues we have outlined already, or updating their approach, it might be relegated to becoming a Tier 2 or Tier 3 esport, not worthy of the stature and success that the game shares. And worse, that could start to cause some serious damage if their design started to shift to appeal to that competitive audience, even for a modicum amount, because the sea of non-competitive esport players in Overwatch is the overwhelming majority of them. Overwatch was marching on ahead with incredible success, scoring 269 million in digital revenue, most likely being primarily from loot boxes present in the game, something that we haven't talked about yet. Overwatch had a base game price, and would allow you to gain skins from just playing the game and gaining the gold. But they would also allow you to purchase a loot box which had the chance to drop a rare skin. The loot boxes being so closely associated with the game marketed towards children though is kind of what rubs people the wrong way. But the success of doing such was undeniable, ushering in the age of the loot box really. Korea, a market known as not being controversial with the subject of microtransactions or loot boxes, by the end of June 2016 was having Overwatch overtake League and PC Bangs across the nation, truly signifying either a change of guard or a new player on the scene. Impressive, even if it was a temporary affair. While not everyone is against loot boxes morally, it should be acknowledged that sort of right under people's noses, Activision Blizzard made a fortune off of loot boxes and putting them in a casual children's shooter game. But I guess it's just perspective and all, right? Overwatch would not only get a new hero in their first major update, Anna, a unique, precise sniper-based healer, they would get a number of balance changes. Most importantly, though, were some balance changes that would also be affecting the new competitive mode. That's concerning hero stacking. Blizzard had taken a stance finally on restricting such in ranked play, not allowing you to play all of the same class, or even more than one. The problem is, is that now you can't even have two of the same hero, which severely limits the game's options even with 22 to 23 heroes. But also simultaneously isn't a good look, because it goes back to what we said previously. Why is Blizzard deciding this important kind of stuff so last minute? According to Jeff Kaplan, the reason being initially the team had developed a team-only competitive queue mode, meaning you can only queue in competitive as a full team. The idea was that as Jeff Kaplan stated, the best way to play the game ultimately was as a full team, as it was designed but also seemed to reduce toxicity and difficulty finding a quality match as a player. The feedback was apparently very negative regarding such though, whatever that means exactly, I'm not sure. But the response was bad enough that it at the very least scared the Overwatch team from pursuing such further. I however think Jeff and the team were kind of right in their idea, obviously hindsight being 2020. They should have trusted the idea despite negative feedback. That's because ultimately, as many of you guys know, as we will discuss shortly, Overwatch would suffer from a slew of toxicity issues. I'm about to email you a picture of my hairy dick. Also, can you even aim that arrow at where they fucking are? They clearly weren't in that corner. That's good you didn't, oh, you fucking idiot. Can you please listen to what I'm saying? So now I know what the problem was. There's a fucking girl on our team. <laughs> also, I get a little cranky from carrying the team! It's also just simply speaking, a better game with a pre-made. Almost an entirely different game even. Overwatch 6 vs 6 with a full team on comms was how the game was meant to be played. But by not having a full team base queue, or at least the option for it, or even the tools to create such, Overwatch was opting for a far more simple and accessible regular ranked format. This was actually proving problematic for Overwatch, because it was suffering from immense toxicity issues, and that was related to how the game was designed. Because Overwatch, as Kaplan himself admitted, is focused on being a team-focused game. When it isn't a full team experience, there's way more room for error and lack of team synergy. While that's pretty typical in most games, in Overwatch the game was night and day different with an organized team versus people just trying to play team deathmatch, which is kind of how most matches would end up. This leads to more toxicity issues, as players get frustrated when their team doesn't work with them, and then when the scoreboard's hidden, you don't even know what you're scoring really or even your teammates are scoring in relation to you. And Blizzard only put that in because they thought that that would curb toxicity but it accomplished essentially the opposite. As now you have no objective measure to know how you or your teammates are even performing. Sure, you have the limited stats that they give you, but those aren't good enough. 
And to make matters worse, the new competitive mode was based on skill rating, which is conflicted, because it only slightly rewards your personal play while giving you a big penalty for losing in a super team-based game. You can imagine how that can lead to even more frustration for players, as some feel like there's little way to personally influence the course of a game compared to nearly every other competitive shooter on the market. Blizzard was aware of the toxicity problems, but they had committed to their course of action, and whether or not it would actually curtail or stop toxicity remained to be seen, but was doubtful, because the core issue aka the game design wasn't being solved. Perhaps had Blizzard done a better job introducing players to each other and forming teams with each other, some of the toxicity issues could have been alleviated, but they would unfortunately plague Overwatch from the beginning of the game throughout most of its life cycle. Almost as if fate had things planned out already, or just a desire to make a lot of money, Blizzard announced an Overwatch League November 4th, 2016, just a few months after launch. If Kaplan's initial approach was, wait for the community to grassroots it, then the new approach was throwing an entire bathtub of gasoline onto the fire and watching it explode in delight. Blizzard wouldn't just be announcing a single tournament either, but an entire professional league meant to emulate real sports with franchising city-based teams and all. Nate Nanzer, the global director of esports on Overwatch, would outline a path to pro, which meant to emulate the real professional sports leagues too. What kind of sports leagues decides what the rules are though and fixes the infrastructure after the fact? After they launch the league, for example? Well, none. But to be fair, sports leagues aren't popping up all the time exactly either. To create an entire league, it's going to take an entire ecosystem of support pieces, professional players, sponsors, broadcast partners, and etc. This isn't just some online tournament or single LAN, it's a series of local LANs in each particular franchise, region, and city. Blizzard trying to do such seemingly overnight, boatloads of money or not, was going to be difficult. They were first going to need franchise teams to sign up, and the slots were very likely going to cost them millions. Rumors would circulate over the supposed franchise teams, with talks of the Patriots owner Robert Kraft and the New York's Mets COO Jeff Wilpon. Los Angeles, Miami, San Francisco, Shanghai, and Seoul would all be franchise team options as well. Seven teams isn't exactly enough to create an entire league, but Blizzard was firm in asking for $20 million for a franchise slot. There was reportedly fair profit sharing from the league to the teams, and then the players. But how on earth was Blizzard going to sell $20 million slots when there wasn't even really an esports scene for Overwatch yet? With salaries for pros at a minimum of $50,000, I was happy for my friends getting paid for being amazing at the game, as they should. But I was worried back when this was announced because there weren't any examples of esports being artificially created and then being successful. There just isn't. It's, it's been done over and over again, it doesn't work. There also wasn't enough information about the challenger amateur scene and the path to pro options that were mentioned either, which made the whole Overwatch esports thing feel even more forced. At the end of the day, the game might have been competitive, but what did it have to be an eSport? And why did it necessarily have the markings of being the best one? So far, no signs of that. But investors were trusting in Activision Blizzard's vision anyway, especially as Overwatch eclipsed 30 million players. They must have figured, well, a lot of players surely means that that's going to translate into a lot of viewers, right? Hello everybody, I'd like to welcome you to this video's sponsor, Chimera.com. Chimera.com is a clothing company that makes sleek and cool, but cheap and affordable clothing for you or for me. I'm currently wearing one of their t-shirts right now, one of their graphic tees, and I really like it. It fits nicely, it's comfortable, and best of all, it's affordable. Here's an example of one of their uh, shirts. You can see it's just a plain tee, this one, but it's really nice. They have nice plain tees, as you can see. The best part about Chimera, besides being affordable and looking good, is that they use premium material with their clothing, but only work with sustainable manufacturers and factories. So if you use code NERDSLAYER next time you're on Chimera.com shopping, you'll get 10% off your next purchase. Thank you to Chimera.com for sponsoring this video. Anyway, detectives, let's get back to the case. Blizzard has been slowly adding heroes to beef up their roster adding Sombra, a damage-based character who can hack an enemy and disable their abilities. But March 2017 and July 2017, two new heroes would heavily change the balance of the game in a way I don't think Blizzard anticipated. With the addition of Orisa, a new powerful shield tank, and Doomfist, a powerful damage dealer with a near one-hit kill combo, Orisa would push the meta even more into a shield-based tank meta, making shields even more powerful, including being able to place a shield now on the ground. 
Shields are simply speaking, not very fun to watch for spectators, and not that fun to shoot at for most players, despite being incredibly important to break. It's one of the most frustrating parts about Overwatch, is that you have to tell your teammates and explain to them that they need to break shields, but who wants to sit there shooting at shields the whole game breaking them? Kind of nobody. <laughs> Doomfist as well just made the game feel less like a shooter, and more like a MOBA, which would become a gradual shift from this point on especially with many hitscan heroes like McCree, or Cassidy, and Soldier 76 being repeatedly nerfed. Now Doomfist was even more powerful due to these nerfs, and due to the fact that he required a team to deal with him, taking advantage of the game's design. While Orisa and Doomfist would complicate the meta and balancing, I don't think they were nearly as problematic as the next three heroes to come later that year going into the next. Kaplan would promise harsher penalties for toxic players, and urge players to use the report features to try and discourage toxic players. But Blizzard's unwillingness to ban accounts was on full display, and many examples of them offering temporary bans on even some of the most egregious defenders. They would eventually introduce competitive mode bans, but even then the toxic players can just play quick play. So you're not really getting rid of them. Blizzard not being firm on toxicity and dedicating the resources needed, as the article would compare them to League of Legends, which had an entire team dedicated to toxicity, and you still get cancer anyway, but anyway, are also huge contributors to the game facing issues. Sure, as we discussed already, the very design of the game can create these toxicity issues, but if the toxicity does happen, and is spotted, and you still aren't really stopping it, that's obviously going to create problems too. Can we please, for the love of God, just get on the point? Use the tanks to charge! Christ! If you're wondering why we're dedicating so much time to esports portion of Overwatch in this video too, it's because we did something similar in the Heroes of the Storm video. And simply speaking, Blizzard has done this before. They have tried to force an esport and it failed epically. That failure takes resources, focus, and above all else can affect the base experience of the game. If Blizzard fails again with forcing an esport on Overwatch, it's going to be a huge blow to their game's community and success. With a hefty 40 game schedule ahead for each of the now 12 teams by November 2017, and a million dollars on the line, it was full steam ahead for Overwatch Esports, with a cool new 200 million in sponsorships from HP, Toyota, T-Mobile, and Spotify in tow. In the beginning of 2018, the news cycle would be focused on Overwatch League and the competitive gameplay, in order to get the game ready for Esports. With more than 10 million across multiple platforms tuning into the league, Blizzard was in position to capitalize on the success and hope it's more than just a one-time thing. Just one or two big events though isn't enough to become the next big esport, nor is it enough to rival sports leagues. For reference, NFL games are pulling tens of millions of viewers every game, not just the Super Bowl. Merely a few months later though, and sponsors were already worried as Overwatch's toxicity issues were spilling over into competitive play. Blizzard was still able to score a broadcasting deal with Twitch though, at the last second, May 2018. To make matters worse, the big question mark over the path to pro stuff that we mentioned previously wasn't alleviated, especially when news came out in October of 2018 that Blizzard would be cancelling any offline tournaments for the Contenders League, stopping amateurs from getting crucial lane experience. Blizzard was also reportedly months late on payment for the Contender players, with some receiving only some of their money or none at all. This likely contributed to the biggest broadcaster of Overwatch Contenders dropping altogether shortly after. The amateur scene suffering wasn't a good sign of things to come in Overwatch Esports, because that's the lifeblood and the future of the game's talent pool. It's never a good sign in any competitive endeavor. Overwatch's in-game spending, aka a fancy way to not say loot box, would top an impressive $1 billion by July of 2019. Overwatch had no signs of going anywhere anytime soon, raking in great successes for their corporate overlords. Well, until the cracks started to form bit by bit, combination of new heroes, balance issues, would start to hurt Overwatch and his scene overall. By summer of 2019, Blizzard had launched six different heroes, but five in particular were problematic. For starters, Moira, the support character who required little to no aiming was added, and to me, she lowered the overall skill floor for playing a support. Whether that's bad or good, I think is actually more opinion-based. Bridget, or Brigad, or however you pronounce her name, nobody ever figured out, was added after, and she would cause many nightmares before being finally nerfed much later. Bridget was basically a tank support who could assassinate enemy assassins due to her kit, which allowed her to basically stun you and then whack you a bunch of times until you died. Sigma was also added, and while not necessarily as outright annoying as Bridget, Brigit, Bridget, Brigit, Bridget, whatever her name is, Sigma yet again increased the shield prevalence, further shifting the meta towards more of a shield meta, because now you have another placeable shield that you can stack 
The three of these characters in unison though slowed down the speed of Overwatch as a game and made the game feel like it shifted it more into a MOBA category than the shooter category, especially with most hit scan and projectile based characters made rather obsolete by these new heroes. They created a new meta altogether dubbed GOATS, which was basically three healers, three tanks, and was dominating the scene. This is where Blizzard's approach to hero design I think never had much place in competitive play. Similar story with Heroes of the Storm. Basically these characters are said from the beginning to be designed to be fun and over the top to attract casual players. To do this requires creating very gimmicky and silly characters that sort of call into question competitive integrity. And when pressed about balance issues due to this, they have a very laissez-faire approach to feedback letting the issues kind of persist for some time. To put kind of bluntly, the annoying part about Overwatch hero design is that it's annoying to get killed by certain heroes. When you can suddenly press a button and your team doesn't die until a field runs out like Baptiste does, is it more of an ability based game or a shooter? When heroes keep getting released that don't require much aiming or shooting and have very powerful abilities, well, you can kind of see my point. Overwatch at launch and in beta felt more like a hybrid of the two. Overwatch by the end of 2019 felt more squarely like an ability based hero game, and that kind of seemed to contradict their constant push to esports and the competitive crowd. In a shocking turn of events, mainly because Blizzard typically takes ages to release sequels, Overwatch 2 would be announced November 2019. Overwatch 2 was set to fill the missing PvE component of Overwatch that Overwatch was only ever to flirt with in events. Overwatch 2 would also be affecting the PvP gameplay including the PvP balancing, hero reworks, and the removal of the sixth hero, making the game now 5 vs 5. Overwatch 1 and 2 players will share the PvP experience effectively. On top of this, they would be nerfing some healing and shields as well as introducing a new game type dubbed Push. The idea is that the shift would move Overwatch to more of an exciting playstyle game, having one less tank. While this might help things, I'm not convinced it's the deciding factor ultimately, but we shall see. Well, if the sequel does indeed launch, with Blizzard being unable to commit to a launch even as late as 2023. The biggest dagger that would come out from the Overwatch 2 news was the effective discontinuing of new heroes and significant content for Overwatch 1, effectively putting the game in some sort of maintenance mode. As long as Overwatch 2 remains unlaunched, Overwatch 1 is stuck in a bit of a purgatory. Limbo. Whatever you want to call it. Sequel announcement in an unsure future, and no new updates for Overwatch 1 isn't good for the game's longevity, and nothing short of dying. Overwatch and subsequently Overwatch League were in trouble by January of 2020. For starters, most of the PvE and holiday events up to this point had just been recycled, which was not very AAA company-like to not constantly be creating new novel content especially with Fortnite out there. Overwatch had become stale, and the aforementioned issues had led to a bleed in the population. But the Overwatch League was facing far harsher problems, with three big broadcasting talents and similar Monte Cristo and DOA dropping out, and complaints overall of just low viewership. Nate Nans of the original OW lead had left the company, which according to Monte Cristo, led to irreconcilable creative and philosophical differences between myself and the League's current leadership. Many reasons for these issues outside of the game's issues and the issues of the viewership though. The pro and talent involved in the Owl League were reportedly having to travel around 76,000 miles, which is nearly double an NBA player's travel time. Throw in the fact that you're playing on a computer and yeah, it gets kind of weirder, right? Owl being a failure isn't a surprise to most who have been in esports for a long time, it's just more frustrating that the failure was so predicted by so many people. Because that's an awful lot of money to be artificially throwing into a scene only to pull it right back out. That doesn't really create an ecosystem, at least not a stable one. Blizzard again has done this twice, and if they aren't a lesson to other developers to not try and force an esport on a game, especially with boatloads of money, I don't know who would be. Blizzard was still somehow able to keep scoring these deals though, as another $160 million deal would come from YouTube, though that would be bundled with the Call of Duty League. Overwatch was meanwhile suffering from more design issues regarding heroes and matchmaking. For starters, in order to enforce the 2-2-2 meta, Blizzard would implement a role queue that would lock you to your preferred role. The problem with the roll queue was, well it highlighted more of the game's problems in the first place. There were double the amount of offense characters compared to the tank or the support characters. So people wanting to play DPS more wasn't just because of support and tank are boring, it was because statistics, right? If anything, it made it worse, funneling everyone into only one role and then giving you really long queue times. Kaplan stated it wasn't an attempt to try to fix the GOATS meta or the esports meta either, which sorry I just don't buy. But by May of 2020 they were adding an open queue mode that doesn't require a role lock back to the game. 
That's basically admitting at this point that they didn't really know what to do, so might as well just go back on what they had said. It seemed like the more Blizzard tried to restrict and constrain their meta and control it and their player base, the more negatively they were reacting. And maybe that's because they were doing it after the fact, or just kind of messing up. 2020 would only see a single hero introduced, down from the previous two and three a year Blizzard was maintaining previously. Which even then, is pretty damn snail pace compared to League or even Heroes of the Storm. By 2020, just four years after launch, players were already starved for content. March 2021 and Blizzard would suffer from a 50-person layoff relating to esports and a shift away from in-person events to online primarily due to the pandemic. They no longer would need the extra 50 people I assume to run the online events, or a convenient way to let go of a bloated esports branch. We don't know exactly. Al was certainly in trouble though, with the last year's grand finals having a 61% decline in viewership from the previous year, but Al abandoning in-person events wasn't going to cut it either. After all, they designed their esports as a franchise-based esport. Without local events to fund the franchise teams, they weren't going to be making the revenue they needed to really even break even. Viewership numbers, most likely, were only going to continue to decrease. And at that point, you're paying millions of dollars for a slot that doesn't make you much money. Throughout this time, Activision Blizzard was involved in a court case regarding rampant toxic harassment behaviors in the company, and this made them fairly negative in the public perception, causing them to potentially lose State Farm, T-Mobile, and Coca-Cola as sponsors. To make matters worse, a Hong Kong esports player of Hearthstone, known as Blitzchung, would don a mask and ask people during a live interview to liberate Hong Kong, the revolution of our times. These protests would be related to the 2019 through 2020 Hong Kong protests. While I'm not going to dedicate much time to the giant struggle between Hong Kong and mainland China, and how China is basically trying to pretend that Hong Kong doesn't exist, and of course the people of Hong Kong are being harassed, silenced, and even worse, in some cases death. But how the controversy affected Blizzard was after the interview, it was immediately pulled off air. How Blizzard responded to the whole thing made people feel even worse, shortly after the stream was cut and Blizzard would ban Blitzchung. Blizzard had shown with the action that they were willing to put Chinese interests over the interests of the people of Hong Kong, or even Blizzard's own audience. Would have been a perfect moment for the group of heroes meant to save the world to kind of, uh, do some saving, huh? Blizzard's last play is the transition to Overwatch 2 something that they hoped to show off in April of 2022 by allowing the OW players to play on an early build of the game. But Overwatch 2 wasn't different or deep enough for many players to warrant being called a true sequel, more of a content update asking for a price tag, and it has not launched for two years after being announced, so the hype is kind of running cold. The future of Overwatch is all but done with the transition on the horizon as we already have discussed. But we're discussing more than just the failure of Overwatch 1 now. If Overwatch 2 doesn't knock things out of the park, there's a good chance that both Overwatches could be in danger for a maintenance mode just like Heroes of the Storm, or worse, total abandonment like Warcraft 3 Reforged. Blizzard would lose many of its most talented developers throughout this drama, the court case drama, and subsequent dramas, including the main driving force behind Overwatch itself, Jeff Kaplan. Kaplan would not only just leave Overwatch, but Blizzard altogether, and we can only speculate as to why. But with Activision Blizzard having so many stories leaked about them at this point, I think we have a bit of an idea. Without Kaplan to helm Overwatch 2, that doesn't necessarily mean it's guaranteed to fail or anything, but it doesn't spell well for the game's future. They lost, arguably, the most important developer behind the project, the one who kind of stuck out and kept the project alive. It feels like the passion left with Kaplan. Not that passion was enough to keep the franchise going without significant change, but it makes the current Overwatch experience, I think, just feel that much more hollow. Especially when, like I talked about with the Blitzchung situation and sexual harassment situations, when the premise of the entire game is built on heroes from all over the world, Mexico, the US, France, Russia, Korea, all uniting together to defeat evil. Meanwhile, the evil in this case is now the company behind the game itself. Well, Overwatch is literally the name given to these groups of heroes. But how are we supposed to feel motivated to play as them for a company who cares so little for its workers and their health? It's that time of the video, detectives, the point where we compile all of the clues and evidence gathered up until this point for a final deduction to put this case to bed regarding the death of a game, Overwatch. <music> Issues with core balance, hero balance, and etc. Conflict design and game focus, like a casual game pushing for esports. A boring and complicated game mode with poor tutorials. Artificially pushed and failed as an esport. Poor content offering and an update schedule for a blockbuster title. 
Issues with toxicity due to built-in design and lack of management by Blizzard. Bad publicity and total loss of faith of their audience. Announced a sequel, delayed it, then put the game in a limbo. Overwatch's failure strikes home for me, as I personally invested a lot of time into the game. But it stands out to me, because here you still have Team Fortress 2 chugging along quietly. Meanwhile, Overwatch has this massive fall from grace. Part of me feels like with their approaches respectively, it was inevitable for the result to happen the way it did, even though they both shared very giant success to start. But I do really feel that Overwatch is one of the highest profile examples of developers just fumbling the bag that we have featured on the series so far. They really had the dream, a massive audience willing to buy loot boxes and make them billions. One who was even satisfied with less content being offered but not the litany of issues that came with being an Overwatch player. Ultimately, Activision Blizzard simply aren't the same company anymore, and can't rely on the goodwill of the previous regime and IPs to save them anymore. And I doubt many are so willing to give them another shot, frankly. But I wish Overwatch 2 the best of success, because I never wish any game or company to fail. But if Overwatch 2 fails as well, then I guess you guys know where to find me, detectives. Thanks for watching, guys.